Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. And breaking right now, a string of explosions in Austin, Texas, leaves two people dead, even more injured, and police believe the explosions may all be connected. Mara? Have you tried calling some of your favorite Southwest businesses and the phone just rings and rings and rings? It is crazy. It is crazy. Going on day 11 with no phone service. But first, horrifying video shows the moment of impact. We're learning dark new details in the death of an Oakland County Sheriff's deputy and the man who prosecutors say killed him. We are not going to show that video, but when Deputy Eric Overall was killed on Thanksgiving morning, we knew there had been a horrible crash involving a suspect on the run from police. And now we're learning more about the crash and about the man accused of being behind the wheel. After it was shown in court, the defendant, Christopher Barrick, broke down in tears. Let's get to Jason Colthorpe with uh, what sparked this chase in the first place. Jason? Yeah, it was certainly a strange sequence of events that Thanksgiving night, to be sure, guys. Christopher Barrick was pulled over the first time for speeding. Officers say he jumped out of the car at one point. That was what we heard in testimony. He was ticketed, sent on his way, but shortly after another deputy spotted the same car at the Lapeer County Jail and initiated a second stop. Take a look. When Christopher Barrick was pulled over for a second time, Lapeer County deputies were cautious because they say Barrick refused to put his Saturn in park and turn it off. After a few moments, he takes off, but not speeding, going roughly the posted speed limit. The chase ended up on M15, continuing through Genesee County and then Oakland County. The court then played dash cam video from Deputy Eric Overall's own car. He hustles to lay out stop sticks, but doesn't see the Saturn until it's too late. A deputy described what he saw from behind. He continued, and then when he got up to the intersection there, I, he, he hit his brake and steered right. Could you see what happened at that point? I observed the deputy be hit. And crazy on behalf of people, I'll maybe call another witness. After the video, which showed overall being thrown through the air, Barrick began crying. Prosecutors then played audio that Barrick allegedly recorded on his phone during the chase. Yes, sir. I am Satan, but I am also God. I am the creator. If you charge me for a ticket for driving on a street that you paved on my planet, I can kill you. Kind of difficult to hear that, but uh, basically he was claiming to be God and the son of God. Um, and uh, that was just a couple of quick clips from that audio file from his cell phone. He also threatened to kill anyone in a courtroom that would try him. He, of course, was bound over for trial. Guys. So we had uh, the first stop and then a second stop. Between them, I guess that audio kind of speaks to sort of the strangeness that led them to pull him over again. Is that right? He was acting, well, he stopped. He was at the Lapeer County Jail acting strangely there and then a prison nearby. He went to both places telling both officers and employees, according to testimony, that uh, he was there to free one of his followers and that uh, it was not fair to have one of his followers locked up due to a violation of man-made laws that they don't follow. Wow. That was according to yeah. testimony. Yeah. All right, Jason. Thanks. We are following a developing story in Rochester Hills where a 39 year old man is in jail after turning himself in for killing his wife. The woman's body was found by her brother in law this morning at her home on Emmons Avenue near M59 in Dequinder. Police say they found her dead on the couch after being shot. While detectives were at the scene, the husband arrived at the Rochester Hills substation and told the front desk deputy that he had just killed his wife. Their names have not yet been released. A 17 year old is dead. Two women are in critical condition after a pair of packages exploded at two different homes in Austin, Texas today. Now, 10 days ago, a middle aged man was killed when he opened a package that exploded. And now investigators believe that these explosions might indeed be related. Both the FBI and the ATF have been called in to help with the investigation. You're not going to tolerate this in Austin and you have seen every stop will be pulled out and the federal agencies have all jumped in with us to lend us a hand and to bring this to as quick of a resolution as possible. Police in Austin are warning people to not open any packages that they haven't been expecting to arrive or any package that appears to be suspicious. Well, we had a beautiful, maybe chilly, but beautiful Sunday, really. But now, look at that. The snow's back again. No, my goodness. We've seen it falling steadily here in parts of town. Ben, are we uh, expecting a lot here? 
Uh, yeah, accumulation wise, no, but the problem could be with visibilities uh, like what we saw last week. Uh, we've got mostly light snow that's out there. That's the light color blue, but you see this stuff that's starting to move in from the north got a little bit more of a punch to it. Uh, some of those snow showers getting a little bit more intense and ironically one of those uh, is heading right towards 94 near Grass Lake Township where we had that big pile up light last week. It does not look like it's intense as what we caused all that uh, problem uh, last week, but nevertheless still could be some visibility issues on the roads tonight until these flakes finally dry out. Air temperatures have been generally above freezing, so that's why we're really not seeing much in the way of accumulation. Plus the rates have been fairly light. The snow does come back tomorrow after wrapping up late tonight. We've got a slow warm up for the remainder of the week and the last two days of winter are on the forecast for this weekend. We'll check those out for you in just a few minutes. Devin. All right, then. For nearly a month after the Parkland school shooting, President Trump is unveiling his school safety plan. It includes ideas like arming teachers and stronger background checks on gun bot purchases, but critics say it doesn't go far enough to move the needle on gun safety. Blaine Alexander at the White House to break down what's in and what's out of the plan. Blaine. Well, hello to you from the White House. After the Parkland shooting, President Trump held a series of meetings and promised to take tough action to stop this. But today, some critics believe that some pressure from the gun lobby caused the president to soften his tone. The White House today rolling out ideas on how to keep schools safe. Topping that list, the controversial plan to arm some teachers and school employees who volunteer and promising federal help to train them. Many teachers against that idea. And you use words like, oh, rigorous training and, and that we will be sharpshooters. I'm grading papers. I'm a sixth grade teacher. The White House plan also calls for stronger background checks and improved mental health systems. But notably missing, a call to raise the minimum age to buy semi-automatic weapons from 18 to 21, something President Trump previously supported. He hasn't um, backed away from these things at all. As I just said, they're still outlined in the plan, but he can't make them happen with a broad stroke of the pen. Now, that idea under review by a newly formed school safety commission headed by education Secretary Betsy DeVos pressed about it on the Today Show. What happened? Well, the plan is really the first step in a more lengthy process. Critics accuse the president of bowing under pressure from the NRA, which is strongly against raising the age. But on Twitter, President Trump pointing to not much political support for the idea. Let's never let this happen again, please. Thank now, you. nearly a month after the Parkland That's shooting, it. we've seen too much of it and we're going to stop it. Critics say this plan does not go far enough to keep that promise. And lawmakers in the House are set to vote on a bill to increase school safety training. That vote is set for this Wednesday, exactly one month after the Parkland shooting. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine. Also, we saw Education Secretary Betsy DeVos in that story. She's now also drawing criticism over her response to questions on educational issues in a lengthy interview that was aired last night on 60 Minutes. We'll have a closer look at that and the reaction to it coming up on Local 4 News at 6. Well, a pair of fires across Metro Detroit this morning. Yeah, the first was in Livonia, where investigators are trying to determine what started that fire. It killed an elderly woman. It happened just southwest of Six Mile and Farmington Road. At this time, investigators do not believe anything suspicious caused that fire. And another fire happening early this morning, this one in Madison Heights. It happened on Hudson near John R. Two people were treated for smoke inhalation. The investigation continues. Palmer Park Academy is closed today and tomorrow due to ongoing con uh, facility concerns. There was a plan to repair the school's roof, but due to concerns about water damage, school's going to be closed. Over the weekend, environmental cleanup crews started working to address the water damage and also test for harmful mold. A special meeting is going to be held by the staff tomorrow morning to discuss how to move forward. If you've been trying to make reservations or place a carryout order at some of your favorite Southwest Detroit restaurants and have been getting nowhere, well, we now know why. AT&T service has been down in a pocket near 18th and Bagley for more than a week now. Mar McDonald is live in Southwest Detroit. So, uh, Mar, what's going on here? Well, Kimberly, that's exactly why businesses here decided to call us. They're like, we can't get a straight answer out of AT&T and our phones don't work. So we did get an answer. Take a look. 
it is crazy. 10 days with no phone service sure has been crazy for Mexican Village. I am so sorry that you had to come down here. It's okay. A mainstay of Southwest for 60 years, this landmark restaurant has no way of getting or receiving phone calls, which means no <laughs> reservations and no carryout orders. AT&T says, well, we're having a little bit of trouble with your lines. We'll have you up by 530. This is on a Thursday. Is this 10 days ago? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mexican Village isn't the only one affected either. If you have AT&T and are in the 18th and Bagley area, you're down. Right now, the only thing saving the restaurant is their Comcast service, which they use to process credit card payments. Now, we reached out to AT&T, and they acknowledge there is a problem. Quote, due to a problem caused by an earlier power outage, a limited number of customers in the Mexican town area may be experiencing issues with their wireline service. Our technicians are working as quickly as possible to fix the problem. I keep hoping that's all I can. Back here live, the restaurant says they've lost out on thousands of dollars in sales in one of the other markets down here. It says they've already switched their phone service from AT&T to Comcast. They just can't take it anymore. Kimberly, Devin, back to you. Yeah, you can't really blame them. They're losing so much business. So I'm wondering, AT&T says they're working on fixing it as quickly as possible. Do they give you any timeline, Warren? It, they didn't, Kimberly. They just said they're working on it, um, which, I mean, as I was talking to Maria, she was leaving here today. She's like, uh, it's, you know, five o'clock and yeah. we have no phones again. Yeah. Back more, to you. More than a week. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mara, thank you. Frustrating. Well, we are off and running on a Monday. That we are ahead in the next hour. Why police say an officer had no choice but to use deadly force overnight in Midland. And is there really a chance a faulty satellite could smash into Michigan? Also making sure Detroit stays affordable. New tonight, a $250 million plan the city is rolling out to make sure people aren't priced out of the market. Larry? It's been a very busy weekend for firefighters here across Metro Detroit. That's why they're asking you to check your smoke detectors. It could be a matter of life and death. It's must at six. A troubling threat. A local teen faces charges after threatening to shoot up a shopping mall. What investigators found that legitimized the probability of an attack. Everyone knows this shade of blue. When that vehicle pulls up behind you, you tend to pull over. And I pulled over to the side thinking it was a state trooper in a, in a hurry to get somewhere. So as it passed me, I realized that's not a state trooper. But a police officer in Gross Point Shores saw something suspicious, wait till you see the video. Okay, Priya, after a string of deadly fires over the past few days, local fire chiefs have a simple message, and that is smoke detectors save lives. Compounding matters, this fire in East Point early Saturday morning left three children dead, and the home did not have a working smoke detector. Let's bring in Larry Spruill with more on a really critical issue. Larry? Critical issue indeed, Deb, and fire officials all over Metro Detroit are urging people to change and check your smoke detectors. I talked to one local fire chief. He tells me oftentimes people forget to check them, but now he's urging you to do so before it's too late. Two fatal fires in less than 24 hours. I was there at both fires this weekend. One was in East Point on Saturday that killed three children and the other in Southfield on Sunday morning. That fire killed a woman. Police tell me there was not a working smoke detector inside this East Point home that killed Brandon, Zaire, and Little Madison on Saturday. As for Sunday's fatal fire, Southfield Fire Chief Johnny Menefee tells me that's still under investigation. Well, it's still undetermined that if they had a working smoke detector. Everything leading up to this point says right now that um, there was not a, a working smoke detector. You know, to check it. Takes very little time. Minifee tells me now is the perfect time to check your smoke detectors and change your batteries. They often use daylight saving time as the perfect reminder. It's a simple action that can make all the difference between life and death. You need the early detection to wake up so you're not you're not waking up to heavy smoke and fire conditions in your in your home. And the fire chief tells me if you cannot afford a new smoke detector that you can stop by the Southfields Fire Department headquarters and they will give you one for free. Reporting live tonight, Larry Sproul, Local 4. Uh, Larry, of course, the chief mentioned smoke detectors in the home, but probably worth talking about the proper placing of them within the home. 
Yeah, Devin, obviously you need to place them in your bedrooms where you sleep, but he also mentioned the rooms that you probably will forget about, like your bathrooms, your basement, and even your hallway. Yeah. All right, Larry. Well, some bad news at the pump today. The uh, AAA is reporting gas prices have shot up again. And the statewide average price for gasoline today stands at just under $2.60 per gallon. That's nearly five cents higher than last week. Michigan saw the steepest price hike in the country. Here in Metro Detroit, we're about two cents under the state average. However, the least expensive gasoline in the state can be found in the Traverse City area. I've been to Moscow in the winter. And <laughs> And oh, no. it just it's it snows a little every day. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, just snows. It's been constantly. nuisance, yeah. And this mm -hmm. is what that feels like right now. This started off as a scene from airplane, I <laughs> swear to God. <laughs> and that turned into something different. But yeah, I mean it is just coming down. It just nuisance. Yeah, but it, yeah that's pretty much it. It's like uh, water torture, but <laughs> At least it's not stacking up out there. That's the good news. Uh, it could be causing some visibility issues, uh, especially with some of these more more intense snow showers that you see starting to stream down from the north. Most of the stuff that we've gotten during the day has been relatively light, uh, but this l next little push uh, could again be uh, causing some visibility issues. So far, this looks like it's almost going due south, so we'll see how much uh, easterly progress that those snow showers make uh, as we get through the next few hours, because it does look like once we get past midnight, uh, we'll see this round come to an end only to re get renewed as we get into tomorrow. So far, everything reported on this side of the state's light. Most uh, spots coming up with dry conditions and cloudy skies, which is kind of sad because last week we were just uh, getting so excited about this extra hour of daylight now that we've set the clocks uh, forward. But with the clouds and the snow out there, it uh, really doesn't feel like all that much to cheer about. 31 in Mount Clemens right now. That's one of the coolest temperatures. We have had a lot of these numbers that have been above freezing, so that's prevented uh, much of the snow from stacking up on the ground. One of the storm pins that we got in from South Lyon uh, says, uh, when is this going to end? But I mean, you look at the picture and it does look beautiful. Why would you want it to end? <laughs> I get it. We've, we've seen our share of snow uh, and it's about time to move on to something else. And uh, hopefully Mother Nature has that on her agenda. Seven days until spring. There you go. The countdown clock is still working even though we <laughs> set the clocks forward. Uh, seven days is all we've got left of winter and uh, spring is going to start next week. So we will be seeing those snow showers come to an end tonight. They will get uh, renewed as we get into the afternoon hours tomorrow. And then it does look like we're going to be dry for the remainder of the week as high pressure starts moving in from the west, pushes that snow a little bit further to the east, and it's going to be a very slow uptick on that temperature trend over the next few days because today's highs, even though they were above freezing, still about 10 degrees below where we should be or where we usually are, I should say, uh, for this time of year. 26 tonight for the overnight low and the snow showers coming to an end. Highs tomorrow will be in the mid-30s, but that's in our metro zone, and those are going to be some of the warmest numbers that we see. Four zone breaks it down a little bit further. Get into our northern suburbs here in the metro zone. 34 in Clinton Township, West Bloomfield, barely above freezing, and that's going to be the story for most of the remainder of the area, especially out there in Lenawee County. 33 in Onstead, Marincy, you're going to be at 34 tomorrow. West zone temperatures hanging right around that 30 two degree mark for most of the zone and there will be spots north of M59 that don't uh, get above freezing tomorrow, especially in Santa Lac and Lapeer counties, uh, 30 and 31. A lot of those numbers there. Tomorrow is 313 day. Wednesday is Pi Day, so we got mm -hmm. a lot of exciting stuff to look. Oh, and then St. Patrick's Day rolls uh -huh. in uh -huh. as we get into the upcoming weekend. So a lot of things to take our mind off the snow. <laughs> <laughs> and a little basketball too. Oh We've yeah, got there's that going on this week. Yeah. Work on your brackets and everything. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we use smartwatches to track our steps and our sleep. But can you really count on it when it comes to your heart? New research has the answer, and we'll have that for you coming up in good health. But first, a Michigan police officer uses deadly force in the middle of chaos. We'll have that next. Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter. Our kids use social media a lot. I'd say I'd check Instagram, like, maybe 15 times a day. How the likes on social media posts really influences them. What researchers discover that can help you tomorrow, starting at 5. Across Michigan tonight, we're following stories from up north in Sault Ste. Marie and right here in Detroit. But let's start in Blackman Township. That's where an armed robbery suspect has died after being shot by police. 47-year-old Kenneth Townley allegedly robbed a Dollar General store in the area, but was also suspected in a purse theft. MSP says five officers from the Jackson area uh, fired at the man. 
They are all now all on paid administrative leave as the investigation continues. Now to our most read story all day on ClickOnDetroit.com. Southeast Michigan has been identified as having the highest probability of debris landing from a free-falling Chinese space station. According to the Aerospace Corporation, the space station is predicted to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere about April 3rd. There is a chance a small amount of debris may survive re-entry and impact the ground. The corporation says the chances of getting hit by a piece is about one million times smaller than the odds of winning the Powerball jackpot. And in Sault Ste. Marie, the U.S. Coast Guard is preparing to begin ice breaking operations. Coast Guard cutters uh, Mackinac and Mobile Bay scheduled to begin work tomorrow on Green Bay, uh, part of the annual spring mission of clearing a path for shipments of uh, fuel products. Officials warn snowmobilers, uh, ice fishermen, and other recreationists to use caution in the areas where the ice breaking will be conducted. New at 5:30. They were trapped as it sank into the water. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Keep the river, engine failure. What we're now learning about the New York City helicopter crash that left five people dead and why only the pilot was able to escape. Toys R Us on the brink of shutting down for good. So what does it mean for gift cards, returns, and customer service? What you need to know so you don't get ripped off. It's a $250 million plan to tackle affordable housing in Detroit. So how many people will benefit and who foots the bill? That's coming up. By land. It's becoming a big problem and the city of Detroit has come up with a $250 million plan to make sure living in the city won't break the bank. Detroit certainly has bounced back from the brink, but with the city's revival, finding an affordable place to live anywhere near the city is getting harder than ever. It really has been a huge issue. Now the city is taking big steps to address that. Let's get to Priya Mann with the very latest. Priya. Well, you know, this is going to make a lot of longtime Detroiters really happy, like Stella Buchanan. She lives at the Lewis Camper Building, and just take a look. Renovations are underway, but this time around, she's actually going to benefit from the upgrades happening here. Downtown should be for everybody. After being forced from her apartment at the Griswold when a new developer bought the property, Stella Buchanan won't be displaced again. And the fact that they're going to reserve this building specifically for people like myself, you know, it's a great thing. And you deserve to stay. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I left the Griswold, it was kind of bad because I had to wait to get there. And then when I got there, they sold it. The longtime Detroiter lives on a fixed income and relies on affordable housing. With downtown rents soaring, folks like Stella may have felt left behind. In his State of the City address last week, Mayor Duggan singled Stella out. And as she said to me, I came downtown when there was nothing but me and the pigeons. And now it feels like the city I love is pushing me out. We said that can't happen. It's an ambitious affordable housing plan. Preserve 10,000 existing units across the city and build another 5,000 units over the next five years. If we're literally not letting Detroiters stay in units that uh, allow them to uh, pay reasonable rents and are well managed and operated, you know, that, that's, that's fundamental to our job. It's fundamental to growing the city. Here's how the $250 million plan breaks down. $50 million in grant funds, another $50 million from public funds, and $150 million in low interest loans. The targeted units are at risk because of years of neglect and expiring low income housing tax credits. They gave us a letter said the building would be sold, but we could stay. I didn't believe so I'm not stressed. I'm just looking forward to all of the renovations being completed so we can really enjoy the building. Now, between Stella's place and a neighboring building, about 160 units will be renovated. The city says they're looking at thousands more across the entire city, and they want to make it clear they're not just focused on downtown and midtown, but the entire city. Council still has to approve some of those spending measures. Reporting live, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Yeah, anybody who's inquired about some of those hot spots, probably very happy to hear that. All right, Priya, thanks. Well, it is hard to go anywhere on the roads these days without running into a pothole, and there's no doubt patching crews are working hard to fix it. Yes, take a look at video Sky 4 got today over at I-696. I mean, just look at that. It almost looks like a, a game of Tetris if you look at it the right way. Tonight, our Kim DiGiulio shows us why all of that hard work is just a Band-Aid and how the real work is yet to come. 
Over the past couple of weeks, you probably heard me mention the emergency pothole repairs on southbound I-75 in Oakland County. And while MDOT has been doing a great job of making these roads safer, with this many patches, the question is, is how long will it last before these roads crumble once again? This winter has certainly been hard on Michigan's roads, the worst we've seen in a long time. This is the worst pothole season we've probably ever seen. The roads are so bad that some people avoid the freeways altogether. So you won't take 75? No, and that the only reason I won't take it is because of the potholes. Over the past couple of weeks, southbound I-75 has had a lot of patchwork done between Coolidge and Big Beaver. There's also been repairs over on eastbound I-696 between DeQuinder and Shaner. While the patchwork is okay for right now, many drivers want a more permanent fix. They're repairing it. It's beautiful at Square Lake where they did the construction last year. That's great. Let's do the rest of it now. So I'd rather see like the whole road get done, but... Asphalt can only fix so much, so. Diane Cross from the Michigan Department of Transportation says these pothole patches should last through this year and into next year. But not to worry, the next time this pavement crumbles, it's going to be time to completely redo the freeway. So we need that material to last until we start pulling out that roadway and then replacing it with the new. The repairs are all a part of the modernized I-75 project. The plan is to replace the concrete from Square Lake all the way to 8 Mile Road. While this major construction project will sure be a headache, I think we can all agree it's necessary. So far, all of the pothole repairs that MDOT has made in this area adds up to about $1.5 million. Reporting along I-75, I'm Kim DiGiulio, Local 4. And remember, I-696 is going to close for a complete rebuild this spring from I-75 to I-94. That project scheduled to last six months. Well, we go from construction to snow talk. It's either one, one, one or the other, right? <laughs> and they're coinciding right now. Exactly. It's quite exciting. Yeah, we do have more snow in the forecast. In fact, it's falling as we speak. Uh, probably another day of it, too, as we get into tomorrow. But let's do first things first. Uh, here's where we sit as uh, we hit the 5 o'clock hour. It's mostly light stuff on our side of the state. Snow showers a little bit more intense. And again, we're watching another one of these uh, snow showers and probably a squall. You see it's gotten a little bit more intense right along 9. This is between Jackson and Grass Lake Township where we had that issue late last week and it looks like that same area is getting hit again with at least a moderate snow shower. So far on this side, uh, the snow has been a little bit lighter, but just within that last 10 minutes, you can see a little bit more intensity here on the east side uh, in the eastern parts of Macomb County out towards 94. So keep an eye out on the roads because we could be seeing visibility problems uh, changing very quickly as we get to the evening commute. A lot of spots not seeing snow right now, but we'll have another shot tomorrow. We'll talk about that and some warmer temperatures in the offing all coming up in a few minutes. Jason. Yeah, and they're seeing some in Kentucky. Uh, then uh, heavy snow falling there overnight with some areas near Lexington getting up to eight inches of it. The storm came in a narrow band clogging roads up, breaking tree limbs, cutting out power to thousands of people. You can see it there. Even parts of I-75 were closed because of several accidents caused by this storm. Mother Nature is going to handle with the rest of the shoveling, though. Temperatures should be into the 50s there by Thursday. Well, this video is just horrifying to watch. A helicopter on a picture-taking tour of New York City crashes into the East River in New York City. Only the pilot was able to make it out alive, and now we're learning new information into the fateful moments when things started to go very wrong. Members of the National Transportation Safety Board are on the scene, tasked with finding answers in the horrific helicopter crash that took five lives. We're getting inundated with calls reporting a helicopter did a nosedive into the river. The single-engine Eurocopter AS350 plunged into the East River Sunday evening. Mayday, mayday, mayday. East River, engine failure. The pilot radioing a distress call just before the chopper went in the water. A search and rescue operation immediately began. In water colder than a bone-chilling 40 degrees, Divers worked to free the victims. Five passengers and the pilot trapped in the submerged fuselage. They were all tightly harnessed, so these harnesses had to be cut and removed in order to get these folks off of this helicopter, which was upside down at the time and completely submerged. The pilot survived after freeing himself from his safety harness. Tragically, all five passengers perished, including 26-year-old Brian McDaniel, a firefighter from Dallas in New York on vacation. 
The helicopter was owned by Liberty Helicopter Tours and chartered for a photo shoot. By the way, Liberty Helicopter Tours has issued a statement saying in part, we are focused on supporting the families affected by this tragic accident and on fully cooperating with the FAA and NTSB investigations. Investigations ongoing tonight after two fertility clinics had malfunctions the same weekend, damaging thousands of eggs and embryos. 2,100 eggs and embryos were compromised the weekend of March 3rd at University Hospital in Cleveland after a liquid nitrogen storage tank malfunctioned. More than 600 women and couples who'd hoped to have healthy babies are left devastated. What our clients lost to these IVF clinics and university hospitals you can't replace. We're just trying to figure out where, where do we go from here. That same weekend, a similar problem at Pacific Fertility Center in San Francisco happened. There is no evidence at this point that the incidents are related. Now, couples who had embryos stored at the Ohio facility are taking legal action. Today marks the first day back to class for students at Central Michigan University since a fellow student allegedly shot and killed his parents in his dorm room. Many students were locked in classrooms and buildings, delaying their start of spring break on that Friday. The university is offering counseling and providing therapy dogs for students as they return to campus. 19-year-old James Davis Jr. has been charged with the murder of his parents and is lodged in the Isabella County Jail. In good health tonight, from steps to sleep, it seems like there's a wearable device to track just about everything anymore. Yes, but sometimes you wonder, can you really count on those readings, especially if you're talking about something serious as your heart? Kimberly Gill is here with a new study that tried to find exactly how reliable these are. Yeah, hey guys, good afternoon. Doctors see great potential in using smartwatch technology to monitor heart patients quickly and conveniently, even at home. But to make that possible, the information needs to be accurate. So researchers put it to the test. Atrial fibrillation, or AFib, is the most common type of irregular heartbeat. It's estimated up to 6 million people may suffer from it. Researchers at the Cleveland Clinic wanted to see if new smartwatch technology could accurately detect and diagnose AFib. The technology pairs the smartwatch wristband with an app that electronically records for 30 seconds. Researchers then compared those results to an electrocardiogram read by a doctor. When uh, we compared the uh, diagnosis made by the automated algorithm to the 12 lead physician interpreted electrocardiogram, we found that the algorithm was able to detect atrial fibrillation with 93% sensitivity. Researchers say because a smartwatch didn't always get it right, it's still important that a doctor read the recordings. But the results were accurate enough that they envision a day where patients who suffer AFib at home may not need to come into the hospital, saving time and resources. Having these tools and looking at the future, maybe these procedures could have been uh, avoided to be scheduled to begin with uh, uh, if we had the, the ability of knowing that the patient is actually back in regular uh, rhythm before we bring them to the lab. Now, Apple launched a study of its own last November called the Apple Heart Study. The company says several customers have learned they have AFib based on information collected by their smartwatch. So I get, you know, it's good, but again, more testing needs to be done. But the main thing is, you, you know, you got to pay attention to your body and right. talk to your doctor. Can so. you use it as a stepping stone? Like, exactly. Okay, do this, but go to the experts. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks, thanks guys. Elon Musk makes a bold prediction when it comes to colonizing Mars. New tonight, why he says it's almost time and why he may have a hard time finding people to go. And chaos at a dog show? New at 5.30, what got some people so fired up they stormed the show floor. A lot of us didn't want to grow up because we were a Toys R Us kid, but unfortunately we're all growing up a little bit today with some grim news for the toy chain. Nobody's singing, that's next. Stop the singing. <laughs> a year of new at six. Brazen Bandits, a community on edge after a heist at a local bank where the trouble unfolded. Nick. If you haven't heard by now, Detroit is hosting the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament and Michigan State is playing here at LCA. But with big games comes big scams. A couple of pointers to save you some money. Well, we've known this since September. Toys R Us was in trouble, filing for bankruptcy, and now rumor has it Toys R Us will join the ranks of Circus World and KB Toys as...
just a memory of a toy store. But what does this mean for shoppers? If you check out Twitter for Toys R Us, it's business as usual. A tweet thanking customers for their support saying in part, our stores are open for business. But behind courtroom doors, business is not as usual. Toys R Us is in Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which is all about reorganization as it tried to find a buyer, but no company wants to buy Toys R Us. So it'll soon change to Chapter 7, which is liquidation. And it's all because of one reason. They had so much debt, there was no way they were going to get out of it unless they found a buyer and the creditors were willing to take a deep, deep discount. It's just too much. Right now, Toys R Us is working out a plan for liquidation, but once things are in order, it'll be quick. Our financial expert, Doug Bernstein, says if you have gift cards, don't wait for word on when your store is closing. Use them now for two reasons. One, it's not going to be any good after they shut down. Two, you're not going to have a selection once the sales start. We should soon be seeing those going out of business sales signs. Same, of course, goes for Babies R Us. So who's to blame here? Bernstein says the company's structure that put them into debt. And of course, Amazon and Walmart played huge roles in the demise of America's favorite nostalgic toy store. I don't want to grow up on a toy's record. Take it, Karen. You know it. Plans are being worked out as we speak. Doug says we'll see all of this unfold sales, store closure dates, everything this week. And uh, the end of Toys R Us as we know it will most likely be in the next month or so.